Matt and I are back for another episode of the Instrumentarium Podcast. This is our second episode, and today I think we will cover oboes one octave lower than the oboe. I'm Brett Newton. I write at bandistration.com, and with me today is Matthew Banks. Hi there, folks. And Matt thought today would be a, a good chance to look at octave oboes. Yes, indeed. Specifically, the bass oboe, as envisioned by Loray, the hecklephone, and then the new modern upstart, the lupophone. Now, you and I have both played on uh, bass oboes before. Neither of us have played uh, hecklephones or lupophones, though. So bass oboe is probably the, the place we need to start. Agreed. I think that's a good approach. And bass oboe is by far the more common of the three instruments. Uh, they've been around since the late 1800s. I believe Loray came out with theirs in about 1888. And the Loray has kind of been the, the model which everybody builds their bass oboe off of. Uh, so let, let's talk about, first off... Um, a little bit of the history of the the bass oboe. Uh, oboes one octave lower than the the oboe itself have been in existence since the 1700s. Uh, they were used primarily in oboe bands in France. We still have a few of those instruments in museums. Um, there's you know octave oboes. There's oboe de basset that was an octave lower, a Swiss made instrument. And you don't get a real firm, good working instrument until the Loray instruments of the late 1800s. But composers didn't pick up on that instrument until nearly 30 years after it was invented. Which is bizarre, because its primary rival, as noted in Strauss's own words, the hecklephone, was put into use almost immediately. It was invented in 1904 by the famous Heckel Company, more known for their bassoons. And Strauss immediately put it in his opera Salome of 1905. I think the big difference there is that the, the French bass oboe, the Loray, was designed by the instrument company. It did not have the backing of composers, whereas the Heckel phone was commissioned by the most famous 19th century composer of all, Richard Wagner. Wagner wanted Heckel to produce a baritone-voiced oboe that could be used in a large-scale orchestra. So at the behest of the composer, the instrument was built, whereas the French didn't ask for the instrument, it just appeared. And this is a very interesting situation where Makers produce something, but composers are reluctant to use it, whereas makers make something on the request of the composer, or really the composer invents the instrument, and it's immediately used. That's a brilliant point. I never thought about it. Well, I think Loray just kind of did that, just like um, they rebooted the Oboe de Amour around the same time. Like, there was no demand for either of those instruments really yet, but they came into existence. The the Oba de Moor that Loray uh, produced at that time, and you're exactly right, they came out within a couple years of one another, or within the same year in the late 1880s. Um, there was a demand for the Oba de Moor uh, because there was such a strong revival of Bach going at the time, and people wanted to be able to perform the works of Bach on the Demore. So, Loray invests all this in the Demore, and really the, the first composer to take up the Demore is a, a rather unsuspecting figure, and one that most people wouldn't think of, it's Gustav Mahler. Mahler is the first uh, composer that I can find that uses the revived Demore in his uh, Rukert leader, and only in one movement, it's uh, Um Mitternacht. And beautiful scoring for it, but it's the only time Mahler ever used the Demore. And it's right after Loray has com uh, comes out with their revised Demore. That's true. 
Um, and I think you're bringing up another good point. There's historical precedent and extensive use of the oboe de amore. Because Bach used it, composers might be more familiar with it and thus employ it, just like Mahler did. And I can't find any literature, Baroque, Renaissance, or otherwise, that was written for an octave oboe, if you will. None that I know of. The earliest pieces we're going to get for uh, uh, an octave oboe that I can find are the uh, the early pieces for Hecklephone in 1904-1905. The earliest piece is an opera called Mona Lisa, and I am trying to remember the composer. I think it's Max von Schilling's. Yeah, Max von Schilling's uh, Mona Lisa is the first piece to call for the Hecklephone, followed very shortly after by Strauss's Salome. Wow. Someone beat Strauss? That's fantastic. Yeah, but they're, they're within a, a year of each other. They're only separated by a few months. So Heckel is out there uh, pushing the instrument and showing it to composers. So you've got really the two rivals at the time, Loray and Heckel, and the instruments could not be uh, more disparate from one another as far as, as, far as oboes go. The, the Heckel phone is a massive beast of an instrument. It Scientifically, as you lengthen the bore of a conical instrument... So, say you take a, an oboe, take the cross section at the halfway point. If you want to make an instrument twice the size of that, you take that same cross section at the halfway point. Mathematically, it should be two times the area of the cross section on the interior bore, which is what the bass oboe is based on. The heckle phone does not follow those proportions. The hecklephone is not two times the area, it's two times the diameter. And it becomes much, much wider, much quicker, so that the hecklephone almost has a saxophone-like bore, instead of the much more constricted bore of the oboe family. Yes, exactly. We, we've talked about it at length, how similar... Really, the bore shaping and the bore expansion in the hecklephone is to the saxophone. It's almost so much that it can't really be used in the orchestra because it'll dominate any sound combination. I wouldn't say it can't be used. I mean, Strauss showed that it could be used very well. I think um, the the best composer there actually to look at is um, Hindemith. Hindemith uh, scored for hecklephone in several pieces, and he said the best substitution for the hecklephone is tenor sax. And a lot of times he'd have tenor sax in C because it just would be the same part and you wouldn't have to retranspose it. Yes, yeah, that's, that's the most common version of that fantastic trio for uh, viola, hecklephone, and what is it, harp? Piano, piano. Yes, you hear it a lot on tenor saxophone, but I've been looking for a good recording with Heckel, you know? And they're out there. Um, uh, but he doesn't only do that in that trio. There's also an opera, um, Cardillac. And I believe he, it's the other way around there. He scores for tenor saxophone, but he has Hecklephone as a substitute in case the tenor saxophone is too rare to be found. Wow. That's kind of hard to process. Like, there was a point where hecklephones might have been more common than saxophones. Probably the case only in German opera houses, where that, that piece was written for. You know, saxophone is verboten in German for, you know, several decades of the early 20th century. And I can't remember exactly when that opera is written, but hecklephone being a good German instrument is going to be much more widely available, and they've got a player on staff dedicated to play it. That's very true. Uh, so let's get back to the um, the Loray-style bass oboe, the French bass oboe. It does not get picked up in France, as one would think. Uh, it, I, In fact, off the top of my head, I can think of no 
um, French music that uses the bass oboe. Can you? I can't. It, it seemed to have taken hold in England, but not in its native France. Right. And so the English picked it up um, right uh, right before World War I. And we, and we have the documentation on this. A Lorraine bass oboe got shipped to, I believe it's the, the London Philharmonic. And it's one of the London-based orchestras at the time, but I believe it's the London Phil. And we know this is the instrument that the British composers were using. Um, up until you get to a few Delius pieces and some back. And they get a little bit more German influence. Delius and Bax will say hecklephone over bass oboe. But we know the early Delius, and particularly Holst, are writing for the, the French bass oboe. And, of course, the classic example of this is the planets. Have you ever gotten to play the planets before, Matt? I, I've only gotten to play a band transcription, which is really a crime, you know. A band transcription of Mars and a band transcription of Jupiter. But I've heard it so many times. I've played the planets before in professional orchestra. And I will say this right now. The bass oboe transforms the sound of the wind section. It's not something you're going to notice so much sitting out in the audience. But I was sitting playing contrabassoon. And I'm sitting right behind the bass oboe. And it is just a fantastic transformation of the oboe section. It goes from being uh, extremely treble heavy to having a punch and a weight and a gravitas that one would not expect from the oboe that's feminine and delicate. And it, it, I was just bowled over by the change of one instrument. I, I mean... It may be one of the most powerful orchestration moments I've ever had. I believe it. Well, I've looked, I've scrutinized the score a lot. And sure, the lowest fourth, where none of the oboes can descend, is loosed frequently for exposed lines, especially in Saturn. But it adds a lot of rigor to Mercury. That's exactly right. It's Mercury where it makes the biggest difference to me. Oh yeah, and even in Mars, in some of the uh, in some of the fainter parts before all the overblown brass, what have you, comes in, it adds a dark, ominous edge to that theme, and any theme it plays. That bass oboe just it it changes the whole timbre of the woodwind section. Yeah, the bass oboe in the planet serves as. The, the bridge between the bassoons and the oboes, but not just that, it's between the oboes and the clarinets as well. It, it almost is a glue for the entire woodwind section. Yes, it's an amazing addition. And it, it's for that one piece in the literature that the bass oboe is still seen. If the planets were not such a huge deal... I don't think we'd see bass oboes nearly as much. Uh, but that said, we don't see bass oboes very often at all. You know, w back in, in February at TMEA, I was shocked beyond belief that they had a bass oboe there, and it was a, um, it was a, um, was it a Fasati that he had there? Yeah, that's the brand. Yeah, and so they they had had the Fasati bass oboe there. Which is um, you know very similar to the Lorray instrument, and you know we both played it, and it's like, man, this instrument needs to be used. People need to be writing for it. That said, you know, you and I both live in the Dallas Fort Worth area, and I can count on one finger the number of bass oboes within a two hundred mile radius. Probably much bigger radius than that. Probably. It's the DSOs and only the DSOs. So the Dallas Symphony Orchestra is the only facility in all of North Texas, probably one of the only ones in the state, to have a bass oboe. And they've got an older Luray. Uh, and that's, that's the instrument we use when I played the Planets. They rent it out to ensembles. 
Um, and they may use it once a year. And I think that's that's a real shame because it's one of the most beautiful solo voices in the uh, the wind section. You know, the the instrument's sounds kind of change in gradations. Like, the English horn's a little bit darker than the oboe. But the bass oboe is a sound unto itself. Like an uber English horn is what it is. If you have a bass oboe, and I wrote a blog about this, a section of two oboes and a bass oboe will do everything that a section of two oboes and an English horn will, plus an added fourth on the end. So you get an added fourth on the low end, and you're not really going to lose that much on the high end because you've got the two oboes covering it. it the oboe family is unneeded, uh, unneedfully shrunk. That with you know the two normal members we have, the oboe and the English horn, we've got an effective range of just over three octaves. Three octaves and a third is about the max range you're going to get out of the oboe section. And that's the same range as the other three main instruments of the orchestra. The clarinet, I mean, on a clarinet, what's your, your comfortable range? My comfortable range, that's a D3 all the way up to B flat 7. So just under four octaves, three, three octaves and a sixth. You know, on flute, it's three octaves plus a little bit. On bassoon, I've got three octaves and a sixth as well. These one instruments have a bigger overall range than the entire oboe family. There's something odd about that, I think. Well, does that have something to do with the oboe's construction and bore size? I don't think so. I think you mentioned once that with reed instruments, there is a, a finite pitch at which the reed will vibrate. And I think you said it's, a, it's close to B-flat 6. And, you know, the oboe can get up to G6 pretty well. A6 is really pushing it. I was at uh, an oboe recital with Alex Klein, former uh, principal of Chicago. And I guess, actually, as of yesterday, he's now again the principal oboe of Chicago. And the audience burst into applause the moment he hit an A6 because it was a room full of oboists and they knew how hard that note was to get. So th there's a cutoff. Uh, around there of uh, what the reed will actually vibrate. So you're not going to be able to go too much on a reed instrument above A6, B flat 6. And this goes for double reed or single reed. Uh, on the low end of the oboe, it's just simply, it stops at B flat 3. Yes, and then for every lower member of the family, the range is even shorter. English horn and bass oboe standard low note is a low B, a half step lower than their written C4. That said, though, some companies are now producing bass oboes with a low B flat. Luray produced his low B flat bass oboes, and you can get them. They're going to cost a little bit more, and I think the, the standard now is Luray kind of wants to produce the low B flat instruments. This is kind of what I, I've been reading. Um, I was doing a little bit of research before we got online about uh, the German company, Mernig. Um, and they've produced a completely new model of bass oboe. Have you ever seen, uh, looked at a Mernig uh, bass oboe? It's, yes, I saw a picture once. Yeah, it's uh, M-O-N-N-I-G with an umlaut over the O. And it is a low A instrument. And so it goes down half a step lower. It's a much wider bore, so it's closer to that of the heckelphone. And it does not have the bulb bell, the Liebfuss, as called in German. It's got a very wide, almost looks like a clarinet bell on it. And I'm not sure what that does to the tone. But that bell's going to be right up against the floor if you're seated. And maybe it'll help project it a little better. You know, I think at TMEA we got into a discussion about what makes low oboes sound less raucous. I believed that it was the bell. You believed it was the vocal. I'm pretty sure you win this one, and it's distinctly the vocal that changes the character of the instrument. 
uh, here's why I say that. Uh, anytime you put a bend in a wind instrument, you are going to increase the resistance. Uh, and I noticed this on my, my new uh, C tenor saxophone. It's got two necks with it, a straight neck shaped like an alto neck and a curved neck shaped like a tenor neck. And there is a marked tonal difference. The, the straight neck is much more free blowing, a little bit brighter. The curved neck is darker. But the, all, the other thing is the curved neck is far less in tune than the straight neck. And you can see this sometimes on some bass oboe vocals. Um, there are three or four different shapes you'll see on bass oboe vocals. The facade we played at TMEA has a fairly straight bend. It's not quite a 90 degree bend. It's a little bit less, but it, there's one curve in it, and it just go, goes out and down. That was part of the confusion we identified it. At first, we thought it was a giant English horn, and then because of that vocal, I think we suspected it was a hecklephone, because that's a lot more like a hecklephone vocal than the longer bass oboe one I've seen in pictures. Right, and, and this is seeing the instrument from across a 12-acre room. So when, you, when you're at that distance, it's a little harder to discern. Normally, we see bass oboe um, vocals with a, a much more complex bend in them. There's one where it goes straight out, curves down, back in, and then down again. There's one where it has a, a swan neck shape, very similar to a bassoon with a little bit of an upturn. And I don't think one of those is no longer being produced. And I think it's the one with the, the double bend in it, the out and back in. I don't think uh, Loray produced that one. I don't think they're producing that one anymore because it just turned out to have too many bends in it. It really increased the air resistance to the instrument. It made the instrument even stuffier than it already is. Yes, and I'm betting that just cuts down projection as well. Uh, exactly. And so you want to have instruments with as few of bends as possible. You can. Uh, the best example of this are... Uh, trombones with a trigger you look at old uh, trigger trombones and they have a lot of bends in the trigger but the new ones that you see professionals using are a complete what we call open wrap and that open wrap means much freer blowing and the trigger notes won't be as stuffy woodwind instruments are the same way but woodwind instruments don't tend to have a lot of bends in them so standard standard low note of the bass oboe is a b natural it's sounding B2. It's right below the open C string of the viola. Uh, but a few of them go down to B flat. And the Monig, Mernig, Mernish, depending on where you are in Germany, or, you know, how you pronounce German, um, it goes down to the A. The A is there because of the hecklephone. Now let's go a little bit into detail on hecklephone. Hecklephone, as I mentioned earlier, was conceived of by Richard Wagner. He wanted to use this instrument for Parsifal, and he talked to uh, Heckel and said, I need a powerful uh, octave oboe that can cut through the orchestra. And he described it as wanting to have the power of an alpenhorn. And the, the letters are still there. Him signing the guest book at Heckel is still there. But Heckel did not finished the instrument until 20 years after Wagner died. Wagner died in 1883, I believe, and the Hecklephone wasn't finished until 1903. It took that many years of research and development to figure out the instrument, and it still needed work after they came out with it in 1903. Yes, so Wagner originally envisioned it for Parsifal to function like an Alphorn? He, uh, he commissioned it at the same time he was writing Parsifal. It's kind of like he, com he wanted uh, the Wagner tuba and uh, the bass trumpet, the contrabass trombone for the ring. He, he had this idea for Parsifal that was the hecklephone that you know didn't come about until 20 years after his death. Had it been constructed and perfected, we probably would have a, a Parsifal with a, a much different woodwind scoring than we have now. 
And I, I hate to say, I don't know Parsifal really at all. I, mean, I, I should fix that. But Wagner's scores are intimidating and long. Very much so. I do know that's one of his very few works where he includes a contrabassoon. Yes, and he only includes the contrabassoon there because Heckel had finally perfected the contrabassoon. And so he does not include contrabassoon really at, at all before Parsifal. And the odd thing he does there is he scores for the contrabassoon at sounding pitch. He does not transpose the part, which makes the part very difficult for the contrabassoonist to read. Oh, Richie. Richie and your notation. So let, let's talk about the, the first early models of Hecklephone. And the earliest Hecklephone that they made is still in existence and still being played. Um, or at least... It may be number one, it may be number two. It's the one being used by the Dresden State Opera. And this is the instrument that Richard Strauss bought. He bought it for the Dresden Opera. It's the instrument that premiered Salome. And there's still a player using it. Um, it's not, as far as I know, had any modifications. It's still the original instrument 113, 112 years on. And this instrument only goes down to a low B, just like the Loray bass oboes. This is something that orchestration books don't mention, is that the low note of the hecklephone is variable, particularly in the early years. A lot of instruments that heckle produced only go down to a written B3 sounding B2. Then he would, the heckle company would add a B flat, and eventually they'd finally add an A, but not every heckle phone has a low A. That's going to be hard to catch. Brett, do you have research to give us like a timetable for when the low A would have been common enough for these orchestrators to say, oh yes, all heckle phones come with a low A standard? No, there, there's not a timetable because every single heckle phone is custom made. So the early production of heckle phones, you know, they, they produced a whole bunch of them before World War I. Then there's a, a span between World War I and World War II where they produce another big batch. And then the production after World War II really trails off. So much so that I don't think they've made a heckle phone in the last 10 years. And so you can go through, there's a fantastic um, heckle information database. You can look up every single heckle phone that they have records on that have come through the internet at some time or other, and you can look at what each instrument has. Only about 120 heckle phones have ever been made. Half of that number are still in use. And some of the instruments are high pitch instruments, meaning they are pitched at... 457, almost a um, quarter step higher than we use today. Practically unusable instruments. Dang, what a shame. <laughs> yeah, half of the hecklephone population is extinct. We just, not usable, don't know where they are. They've been destroyed. Um, and yes, some hecklephones have been destroyed. There's rumors that somebody shoved the upper joint of one into a garbage disposal. Um, I've seen pictures of one that had extensive wood rot because somebody left it in an attic. So it's an extremely rare instrument, probably only about 60 extant and being used today. To get a brand new one, it, the heckle waiting list last I knew, and this is from a few years back, was about 10 years. So you had to get on the waiting list, then wait 10 years, but they weren't taking any new names to go on to the waiting list. They're that backlogged. Jesus, man. It's a, uh, it, it's a bad situation for it. Uh, and so you were asking, timetable, when the low A came about. Probably the first low A's were within the, the, probably the first 10 years of Heckel producing the instrument, but it was not standard. And this is probably best evidenced, uh, the standard low range, by Strauss's writing. In Salome, Strauss writes down to a low B. And this is solid. Every hecklephone ever made goes down to low B. The instrument Strauss himself bought goes down to low B. And only low B. Electra, the next piece he used it in, 
Okay, well, we've got a little bit lower. We've got uh, a B flat. There's some A's. And he accidentally has a G sharp at one point in the part. But this is in a big 2D section. Nobody's ever going to hear it. No worries. The, the next big piece he uses it in is the Joseph's Legenda, Joseph's Legend. And there is a low G in there. So he's now a whole step below the lowest heckle phone ever made. Now, the big piece is the Alpine Symphony. And Alpine Symphony is one of my absolute favorite pieces of music of all time. But there are low Fs in this piece now. And some of the thinking is, is that Heckel was going to produce a low F instrument at some point. And this is, uh, Strauss is writing this piece right at the edge of World War I. It's completed, it's premiered in 1914, right as World War I is just about to break out. And, well, production of instruments stops for a good while in Europe at that point. And innovation stops. You can really find a firm cutoff point of 1913, 1914 for instrument development and innovation, not just from the manufacturers, but also from the composers as well. Because of the Great War. And no heckle phones were made during the Great War, correct? Uh, I am not sure on that. Um, I know that heckle ceased production during World War II. Um, there's a fantastic story there that the Heckel uh, factory was only saved from bombing by an American pilot who happened to be a bassoonist, happened to know that was Heckel. You don't go bomb the Heckel company if you're a bassoonist. You'd be vilified from the bassoon company. And so he said, no, don't, don't bomb them. That's an instrument maker. And at the same time, Heckel had taken all their stuff out of the factory and had moved it into a nearby cave in order to protect it. And World War II is over. The bassoonist who did not bomb Heckel goes to Heckel, and I believe Heckel gives him an instrument in gratitude. Wow. That's... Well, when I think about how much I occasionally see a Heckel instrument on eBay, that's almost priceless now. Oh, yeah. Uh, you know, Heckel instruments are exorbitantly expensive. You know, a, a Heckel phone is going to run you about $30,000 used. And I say used because you can't get a new one right now. When one pops up, $30,000 is around the average. You know, maybe less if it's not in working condition, but there's not going to be a lot of them come up. On the on the other side, a, a Lorray bass oboe is going to run twelve to 15000 depending on if you want a low B flat or not, third octave key, and a few other accoutrements. Half or less than half, which is why you see so many more bass oboes than you do heckle phones. And I, I put that emphasis on so many more. It's still a very, very low number of each. Though I can't help but note that in a lot of the texts, like in a lot of the sources, especially like I've got in abridged, orchestration definition book it mentions that there are more heckle phones than there are bass elbows and the bass elbow will eventually be replaced that's also mentioned in uh, donald grantham's orchestration book it's mentioned by adler that the heckle phone will replace the bass elbow and then uh, that uh, book on the history of wind instruments by baines mentions that Heckle phones are in much more abundant number than the lower A bass oboe. And I think that was in the 1950s, maybe. There's uh, two or three different editions of the Baines. It depends on when he was writing that chapter. The classic text by Cecil Forsyth, Orchestration, says basically the same thing. It talks much more about the, the heckle phone and has a brief couple sentence paragraph on the bass oboe. So... The textbooks skew this very much in the opposite direction of reality that the, the bass oboe is the far rarer of the two instruments when indeed it's the heckle phone that's the far rarer. Yes, and even Strauss does that too in his famous uh, 
blurb in the orchestration text, like, to quote it, the baritone oboe constructed by F. Loray in Paris is a new accession to the orchestra. It has recently found a rival in Willem Heckel's Hecophone. He spends one sentence on the bass oboe, doesn't give us a range, doesn't give us a transposition. He moves on right to the Hecophone. <laughs> This, this could be, remember, Strauss is writing this 1902-1903. Uh, it's right as the Heckle phone has just come out. And he works some with the Heckle company. It, there's a chance at this point that Strauss has never seen or heard a Loray bass oboe. He's only uh, seen it mentioned in text. So in, in Germany at this time, yes, absolutely, the Heckle phone is the predominant instrument. And it seems that there's a trickle-down effect from this. Every text written after the Strauss goes off of that blurb in that footnote and says, okay, this is how it still is. This is how it still is. And so you can see an artifact of uh, either poor research or just copying the information from one source to another. So Strauss said, a, the, the Hecophone is, is your instrument of choice. And Forsyth says the Hecophone is your instrument of choice. And Piston says the Hecophone is your instrument of choice. And Adler says it. And it all goes back to this one, two paragraphs in the Strauss footnote. Whereas the reality is the bass oboe is your instrument of choice. The Hecophone is rare. Yes, 60 extent. I've heard whispers that there are 24 in the United States? That seems about right. Uh, there are a few held by universities. There are several in private hands, but there you don't see them often. Have you ever personally seen a heckle phone? I have never seen a heckle phone. Uh, I have once. The 2005 International Double Reed Society Conference was in Austin, Texas, and that year um, Robert Howell gave a solo hecophone recital. Probably one of the few solo hecophone recitals that's ever been given, and I happened to be at that performance. You know, fantastic sound. I, I wish I had a more vivid memory of the sound of it, but, you know, fantastic instrument. But that's been 11 years since the last time I even saw a heckle phone. You know, Brett, there's a chance that it's been 11 years since a heckle phone's been in Texas, even. Uh, very possible. Uh, I take that back. I've heard that the University of Texas at Austin does have a heckle phone. But that, that's a rumor, and that was something that was said while I was down at the conference. I, I cannot substantiate that rumor, though. But at any rate, it's very, very rare. Even rarer than any bass oboes. Let's, I want to talk now about composers treating the two instruments in their text. Uh, they treat them as being interchangeable. And performance-wise, performers are going to tell you the exact opposite. A bass oboe and a hecophone are not going to be interchangeable. The oboe performer, the oboist, is going to hands down prefer the bass oboe than the, the heckle phone. The bass oboe is a much more manageable instrument. It's easier to play, and it's based on standard oboe key work. Whereas the heckle phone, one, varies from instrument to instrument, uses a different uh, fingering system in some cases, and uses a bassoon reed that an oboist won't necessarily be comfortable with, which is one reason you find most hecophone players are actually bassoonists who are moonlighting on this weird instrument that they're going to get paid a doubling fee for. And it was designed intentionally to use the bassoon cut reed rather than the oboe cut reed? Correct. So it uses a slightly smaller than normal bassoon reed, and so... You know, I could put one of my bassoon reeds on a heckle phone and it will work. It may not be absolutely perfect, but that's what it's designed for. So it gives you a, a, an idea of how much bigger the bore is that it can support a bassoon reed, whereas the, the bass oboe reed is just an oversized English horn reed. In fact, uh, when we played Planets, uh, the bass oboe player just said, I, I t took, you know, uh, my English horn reads and just sized them up 
kind of by eyeball, and it seemed to work for the base elbow. It wasn't that much bigger of a read. That makes me wonder, in addition to boar, how much of the different sound comes from the different size and different cut of reed, even? Quite a bit. I mean, that's, that's the mouthpiece of the instrument. That's the sound of the instrument. I can change the sound of my bassoon simply by changing the, the cut of the reed. If I want to have a more French-like sound, I know how to do that. If I want to have a darker sound, I know how to do that. 90% of the instrument sound lies in the reed itself. Understood. Thanks for the clarification, Brett. You look at how Strauss writes for the hecklephone. Strauss's parts for the hecklephone are designated hecklephone only. There is no doubling. The hecklephonist does not go to English horn, does not go to oboe, does not change instruments. They have the hecklephone only. Uh, this is unlike uh, uh, contrabassoon, where the contrabassoonist will go to bassoon, a bass clarinet, the bass clarinetist goes to regular clarinet. English horn, they go to oboe. Hecklephone stays on hecklephone all the time in all five pieces that Strauss uses. When composers are writing for bass oboe, like in The Planet, this is not the case. Hulse makes no bones about the bass oboe player going and playing oboe three. And so Mars, Mercury, uh, Saturn, and Uranus all have bass oboe, whereas Venus and Jupiter is there one I'm missing? I don't think so. Venus and Jupiter have oboe three. Same player. The player is not going to want to use a hecklephone on this part. In fact, I talked to Patrick McFarland once, who's a former English horn player of the Atlantic Symphony, said he played the bass oboe part on both a bass oboe and on a hecklephone. and said there's no comparison. You cannot play the, the bass oboe part of the planets on a hecklephone. I mean, you can, it just doesn't have the same effect. The The piano low B entrance in Saturn doesn't work. I mean, it's it's going to come out at a mezzo forte forte at the softest. So we can think of when composers are writing for the bass oboe, they're writing for an instrument that's capable of much more subtlety than the uh, hecklephone. Yes, it's, it's not going to have that big overwhelming sound. It's going to be always played by an oboe player, whereas on hecklephone, it, it's a toss-up. Who's going to play? Is it going to be an oboist? Is it going to be a bassoonist? Who knows? It's going to vary from player to player. And so if you want to have, have a, a double part where it goes, it switches from bass oboe to English horn or bass oboe to oboe, it's probably not going to be played on a hecklephone. Assuming you have both available. Well, hecklephone seems much more like a specialty instrument, which Strauss explicitly has decided should not double anything else. Right, and the hecklephone is a specialty instrument, whereas the bass oboe is like any other member of a woodwind family. So you have you know all your different sizes of clarinet. Any clarinet player with you know moderate amount of preparation can pick up a bass clarinet, can pick up an alto clarinet, can pick up an E flat clarinet. Well, an oboe player can pick up an English horn. They can pick up a bass oboe. They're going to look at that hecklephone and go, "What the heck is that?" Yeah, exactly. This comes and leads us into the third instrument, and the third instrument is the lupophone. The lupophone is a brand new instrument. It's a hybrid between the two. It's not quite as big as the hecklephone. It's not quite as small as the bass oboe. It's a nice medium in between. It can get the sound of both instruments. And the added bonus of the lupophone, low F. It is extended down a perfect fourth from the lowest standard note of an oboe, the low B flat, the list goes down to a low written F. So sounding F2 right below the bass clef. And correct me if I'm wrong, but it's built that way explicitly to play the part in Ein Alpine Symphony correctly. Yes, it is designed exactly to play the, the hecklephone part in the Alpine Symphony. And it's done by means of a couple extra thumb keys. So the hecklephone normally has one extra thumb key for the right thumb that activates the low A. Well, the lupophone has 
uh, a right thumb key for A and A flat. And then in the left thumb, it's got G, F sharp, and F. I think it's that way, or maybe the other way around. It's three and two. So it's got some extra thumb keys. Not a big problem. The instrument is resting on a peg. You don't need the thumbs to support the instrument. And so you've got these extra low notes. It's essentially another voice below the bass oboe. And so this instrument now has a functional three octave plus, three octave and a second, three octave and a third range. Bigger than any other oboe in existence. Yes. It's built by Guntram Wolf. And Guntram Wolf is an interesting company. I knew Guntram. Uh, he passed away a couple years ago. Uh, my my bassoon is a Wolf bassoon, and he it, it's very interesting. It's the only company woodwind company in the world that specializes both in innovative modern instruments and historical reproductions. So if you want a good historical instrument, chances are if you want a Baroque instrument, you're gonna go get a, a Wolf instrument. Well, uh, <laughs> on the op opposite end of the spectrum, they're innovating and designing and pushing double reed design to a, a level where it's never been. They developed the, the Lupophone, which is this phenomenal bass oboe, as well as the Contraforte, a complete revolution in the Contrabassoon. But it's definitely one of the most innovative. So you've got this new instrument, and composers are like, hey, I, I want to use this instrument. This is finally something we can use. Performers are like, you know, I could use this too. And, and the selling point really is, is the price point. The price point is within the realm of a standard bass oboe. And 12, 5, maybe up to 15. It, it, that's, that's the price range. It's half of what a heckle phone costs. It does more than the heckle phone. It can get the same kind of sound. And it's, got, it's more flexible. So this is, this is probably the wave of the future for... The octave oboes is an instrument like the lupophone. Uh, by the way, if you don't know lupophone, uh, lupos is Latin for wolf. He didn't want to call it a wolfophone, so he went Latin lupophone, the sound of wolf. Now, before I read that definition, I thought it was called the lupophone because thanks to the length of its tubing, it bends up a couple of times and the vocal bends down, creating a semi-loop, if you will. <laughs> That's before I got the Latin definition. Yeah, not quite, not quite. So, lupos. So, we've got, got these three instruments. They all function in roughly the same role. Um, so, uh, the, the limited use in orchestra, you know, you're going to be, if you want to study the instrument, you're really going to be looking at about four or five pieces that really kind of hit home. The planets is A number one. You've got to study the planets. Solomon and Electra. And in Solomon and Electra, they have very different roles from one another. It, Salome is really the more predominant hecklephone piece. Um, simply because in Electra, Strauss uses two basset horns to do some of the similar role as the, the hecklephone in that tenor woodwind role. So the basset horns take over what the, the hecklephone would have done. Um, you've got the Alpine Symphony, and then one that a lot of people seem to forget is Delius's Dance Rhapsody Number no. One, which is a, a phenomenal piece, never performed, but opens up with a, a beautiful duet between English horn and bass oboe. Yes, it's a beautiful piece of music, which really is reminiscent of Granger to me. And having read Delius's biography and knowing that those two were close friends, it makes perfect sense. But the Dance Rhapsody really should be included in the repertoire. I absolutely agree on that. The Dance Rhapsody of Delius is, is a phenomenal piece. Most people play the Dance Rhapsody number two, and that doesn't have the bass oboe in it. And that's probably part of the reason why it's popular, because they don't have to go to the DSO and rent out an instrument, or if you will. Of course, you, you mentioned Granger, and Percy Granger's Warriors... Uh, again, phenomenal, phenomenal piece, so rarely performed, but it may be the, the king of bass oboe pieces. In the middle of the Warriors, you know, this fantastic imaginary ballet, there's a full minute-long bass oboe solo. 
and considering the piece is only 18 minutes, Granger devotes that much of the piece to featuring a long, extended, lyrical, plaintive bass oboe solo. Everything calms down and bass oboe for a full minute. It may be the, one of the longest woodwind solos you'll get in literature. Yes, let alone Granger, who's known for his democratic style of scoring. It, it's very uncharacteristic of Granger. And, and in fact, what, what Granger did is he, he stole from another one of his pieces. It's the, uh, the lonely desert man sees the tents of the happy village people. And it's, uh, it's a weird chamber choir ensemble piece that he did. But the melody is from that piece. And I remember I listened to the... Uh... I listened to the clip you posted on your blog, and I was able to use my uh, ears to figure out the range of the solo is just over two octaves from B2 in the bass clef to C sharp. I think it's C sharp. C sharp 5? Yeah, C sharp 5. Yes, a really wide range, larger than Delius or Holst used in their bass oboe works. High range of the instruments, since you brought that up, talk a little bit range. Heckelphone has a more comfortable high range uh, because of its bore structure. It can play up to high F, usually no problem. Notes up in the third octave on the bass oboe are a little trickier. You know, you don't really need to be writing too much above a written high D on bass oboe, but it can go up to the F. It's just going to be thin. Probably better to score that in the English horn. And I've forgotten, but the bass oboe ideally uses the same triple octave key system that a conservatory oboe does, right? Right. So the Luray instruments now are made with the triple octave key. The old instruments, of course, won't. But again, getting up to, into that range, you know, D, E, F above the staff, you probably don't need that on the bass oboe. But it's there. It's It's a timbre that can be exploited. Just remember, it's going to be faint it's going to be airy it's not going to be the fullest sound on the instrument yes it loses its character in that range but hecklephone can um and since we focus a lot on band music there's not a lot to say here other than there is a single piece of band music that calls for bass oboe and again we go back to percy granger it's uh, the children's march you know he got he has uh two oboes and a bass oboe but the bass oboe part in any recording you'll ever hear any performance you'll ever see it's always going to be covered by the english horn it can cover most of the notes and you don't have to rent a bass oboe from somewhere i found one exception though i was talking to eugene corporon the conductor of unt's top wind ensemble and when they did children's march a couple of years ago one they used a brand new Selmer bass saxophone, as they rightfully should, and they borrowed the DSO's bass oboe for that one performance. And so that's a very, very rare instance of a band conductor um, being very faithful to the score and going out of their way to get an instrument that you know most band conductors won't use. Um, I myself have used bass oboe on a couple of occasions. Um, my my second ever band piece, the the Black Mass, um, has a prominent bass oboe part in it, as well as tenor bassoon. It's it has a very expanded wind section in it. Um, there's not a lot else though. You know, my my piece is still yet to be performed. Um, probably should get on trying to find an ensemble to do that, but. You don't see it often in band music, and I, I find that to be a, a real shame because, again, that's a register, like we talked about alto clarinet last week, uh, a register of the band that is remarkably lacking in tonal diversity. It's that tenor section. Yes, not to mention that the band could use more double reeds, period. Like, but especially in that register, the bass oboe, or more likely in the future, a lupophone could uh, really fill the gap, as it were. Yeah, and you know this this goes all the way back to um, Arthur Clappe, who was the um, head of the band's program for the United States Army 
um, back in the early 1900s, he set up the first Army uh, school band. I, I believe he was at West Point. Uh, I, I'll have to check. I've got the his text somewhere around here, but uh, not quite handy at the moment. Uh, but he wrote a fantastic uh, text on wind instruments and scoring for the band. It's really one of the, the very few texts out there on band scoring. And he talks quite a bit at length about using these tenor voice double reed instruments, particularly a bass oboe, uh, and also a big advocate at the time of sarusophones. Granger was a, a pupil of his and went and studied a lot of what Clapé was writing. And, you know, the direct result of that is, of course, the Children's March that Granger wrote for Clapé's band, and probably the, the Gilmore band in there as well. But Clapé's band at the time, 1912, was using bass oboe in their band. And we've got a few other examples of that. Um, uh, Austin A. Harding at the University of Illinois uh, was using both um, bass oboe and hecklephone in his band uh, up until probably about 1939. Wow. Have you ever read any about the, the Harding band at University of Illinois? I have not. They had a gigantic instrumentation. You ever see, seen that photo of a group of about eight sarusophonists all just sitting there posing? Yeah. That, that photo is from the University of Illinois band. So they've got eight sarusophonists and a bass oboe and a hecklephone and basset horns and then all sorts of auxiliary brass instruments, including a sub contrabass tuba and E flat. He had this huge expanded band, and once he retired, the next band director came after him and said, oh, we're shrinking it back down to normal size. So there, there is this latent possibility that was explored in you know the 1930s at the University of Illinois that you know had all these extra voices in it wow what a you know what a loss that that doesn't exist anymore anywhere man the the instruments he used are now in a museum the University of Illinois has a, an instrument museum and you know, the, I think the Sarusophones are there on display. Either that or they're tucked away in an instrument room somewhere. It's one of the few uh, C contrabass Sarusophones in existence. And we'll talk about Sarusophones in another episode. But using hecophone and bass oboe at the same time, he, that's probably the most obscure sound you could possibly try to get together in the 1930s. Let <laughs> have known the most expensive now. My goodness. Uh, yeah, it, but he, he wasn't the first to do that. Um, Sir Thomas Beecham uh, did that as well. And he, there was a, a band he organized in London. I can't remember the band's name, but he had both a, a hecklephone and a bass oboe as well in his band. And so it's it wasn't unprecedented for Harding to do that. Beecham did it before, uh, but the Beecham band did not last very long. Beecham was a collaborator of Delius. He premiered several of Delius's works in England, I think. Yes. And if you want an absolutely hilarious read, go find Beecham's autobiography, A Mingled Chime. Uh, you'll laugh out loud. He was just a hilarious guy. Uh, great conductor. Um, premiered lots of weird and obscure works. And, you know, you know, not your typical tyrannical conductor of the day. He was a funny guy. Well, you know, I think this might segue into uh, what function an octave oboe can have in the primary ensemble in both of our scopes, the band. It, it's, it's your tenor voice. And, you know, the, the double reed family, if, as you look at it, if you look at you know, oboe and bassoon being a complete family, which, which they're not, let's go ahead and clear that up. Oboes and bassoons are separate families. They're as distinct as clarinets and saxophones are from one another. But for a lot of compositional purposes, we have to group them together because bassoons are an incomplete family as they don't reach into soprano. Oboes are an incomplete family because they don't reach into bass. The, the bass oboe can bridge that a little bit. 
Hecklefall may do that a little bit more because it's got it's a hybrid. It's got characteristics of both. But if we want, just want to look at, at bass oboe itself, it fills in that tenor role. The English horn and the bassoon are effectively an octave and a half apart from each other. From the lowest note, they're an octave and a half apart. From their highest note, though, they're only half an octave apart, which tells you something about the, the compressed nature of the range of the oboe fan. Very much so. In some of my, my newer pieces, if I score for bass oboe, I actually end up calling it tenor oboe because if I think of it as a, a tenor instrument, it fills in that role a lot better than as a bass instrument. As you, as you would know as a former choir person, it suits the tenor voice almost perfectly in its most characteristic range. It fills in a, a tenor role. It can go along with the alto clarinet, with the tenor saxophone. And you put those instruments together, you've got a real meaty tenor register within the woodwind section. It seems like the first couple episodes, we really kind of like our tenor instrument. They're, they're absolutely fascinating, and they're probably the most neglected woodwind. Well, one of my favorite timbres I hear in the band world, even though more often than not it's incorrect, is the opening melody to Children's March, because that opening melody is scored for bass oboe, most likely played on English horn. Bassoon one, alto saxophone and tenor saxophone in unison, and it's just such a fantastically reedy, warm sound that all four of those instruments get, you know? Yes, and, you know, again, one reason Granger is probably the premier band orchestrator that we've ever had. He's got these fascinating instrumental combinations, and that, that opening of the Children's March is one of his best it's a shame that that's the only piece for band though that he used the bass oboe in think about if he had used bass oboe in lincolnshire posey i i could almost guarantee you that we would see bass oboes being much more common if there was a important bass oboe part in lincolnshire oh absolutely or if holst had included bass oboe again after the planets like He's kept the instrument alive, but as you said, if Granger used it more, we might have a bass oboe in every band room. That might be a pipe dream, but... <laughs> that is definitely a pipe dream. What really needs to happen is somebody needs to sit down and write a, a master work for band that requires bass oboe, and then somebody else does, does the same thing, and somebody else does the same thing. If there's a core of fantastic works that your band is compelled to perform and we're talking stuff that's probably going to be on a college level not not high school level not junior high level but you know you look at on a college level if you have this core of works that say we want a bass oboe we need to have this bass oboe um let's make it happen i think the innovative band directors out there will find a way to make that happen and I don't think it's going to happen through orchestral music. The orchestras are set in their ways. They've got the economics to deal with. But if you look at a college situation, you're far freer there. You don't have to worry about hiring extra players. You've got them, it's particularly the bigger universities. Hey, we need another oboe player. Come on. You're playing in the second band. I need you in the first band today. That's much easier to do. Agreed. Well, and also, as one of my old conductors loved to say, you don't have to keep the uh, blue-haired old ladies happy by playing Brahms every concert. <laughs> yes, and, but you know, there's the downside to that. A lot of band pl players will graduate from college having never played some of those pieces. All they know is going to be, the, as somebody eloquently said, the farts and whistles music. So and then that's what they, they know, that's what they hear, and it will perpetuate more of the, the farts and whistles music. You have a point. You have a point. I brought up to my college band director, someone who had been conducting for 40 years, and I said, hey, have you ever played the, uh, the Berlioz Symphony for band? I'm talking about the Symphonie Finubre et Triomphal. He said, I didn't know there was a Berlioz Symphony for band. And I kind of facepalmed there. I said... Here, here's a recording of it. Didn't do anything. It, he knew, then knew there was a Berlioz Symphony. Nobody plays it. Bands don't program it. 
but that's the literature and it's kind of neglected. So this in, these instruments need to be brought back. Like you said, someone needs to get uh, get working on some masterworks. Wink, wink, nudge, nudge, Brett. Uh, I've got a piece that has bass oboe in it right now that I'm working on. I've kind of put it on the back burner as I'm working on the, the double concerto right now. But uh, yeah, th that piece will ha definitely have a prominent bass oboe part. And I'm not talking about the Alpine Symphony. That's way down the road. But um, the, the Forest of Dreams definitely has a prominent bass oboe part in it. Fantastic. You know, one other thing that could push it forward is more advanced solo work. You've written a solo for bass, oboe, and strings, right? Right. It, it's a, a transcription, actually, of a, a bass saxophone piece I wrote. And I, I said, hey, you know, I transcribed this for bass, oboe. It might be popular. It changed keys a little bit, changed some other stuff. But it, it's out there. Yes. And, you know, I also wonder at the wisdom of using the Lore, the Fofox, or the Munich bass oboes. We were going over prices the other day with the Lupophone, and I was baffled by the fact that there's not one sitting in every orchestra's uh, back cubby, because $15,000 isn't that much in the grand scheme of great instruments. But look at it this way. How often are you going to be performing one of the pieces that require bass oboe or hecklephone? And grand scheme of things, it's probably every two years, every three years. You know, last time I saw a bass oboe used uh, was when I played the planets. Before that, I saw it used in a performance of the Alpine Symphony, which it, it clearly is not the right instrument for. But they're not going to put out this kind of money on an instrument that's only used every couple years. They're going to put out money for much more useful things. You'll, you'll see rotary trumpets before you will see uh, a lupophone. You bring up a good point, something I didn't really think about, but it doesn't make sense to pay $15,000 for a low F in Alpine Symphony, which you perform once every 20 years or so. Or, or longer, depending on the orchestra. You know, Dallas Symphony performed the Alpine Symphony, oh, it might have been 2004, 2005, hasn't performed it since, and probably had been decades before they performed it before that. There's so much good music that just isn't performed. A lot of that depends on where you are, what orchestra it is, what the taste of the people around you are. I mean, Dallas is very much Brahms and Tchaikovsky. Uh, they they love that, you know. Not so much, you know, the the Strauss. Definitely not the modern. But I, I think in in order for bass oboe to really take off, like I said, it's it's got to have, it's got to have a modern Mozart. It's got to have somebody writing important parts for it that cannot be left out. It's more than likely going to happen in the band world as opposed to the orchestral world. You can write a new band piece and get it performed much easier than you can write a new orchestral piece and get it performed. Probably ten times easier to get a band piece performed. Certainly. There's also just more bands around. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. On, on every level, except the professional level. You know, bands don't exist except for very few at the professional level. Being so close to Dallas, we're spoiled. There are two professional bands that are more or less equal that both call Dallas their home. Right, and you you play with one of them. Yes, I play in the uh, Lone Star Wind Orchestra. Eugene Corporant, who conducts that as well as the UNT group, is getting, he's looking to the ensemble to utilize its, uh, built-in talent more, which includes featuring more soloists, but also featuring more in-ensemble composers. And he likes to use a big bassoon section, so... Nothing wrong with a, a nice big bassoon section. Indeed, like, I was baffled. For one concert, we had five bassoons in Contra, but it's normally four in Contra, which is great, because you can hear them in our reduced instrumentation. That, that sounds like it probably balanced a lot better. Very much so. And the maximum number of clarinetists I'm playing uh, first and second usually is somewhere around eight. One E flat, 
eight B flat clarinets. I haven't prevailed on Eugene to use the alto or basset yet, but two basses and four bassoons and a contra can make a dent in that. Oh, big time, big time. So that does make me want to ask, what's your ideal medium large size oboe section to add to a band that hypothetically has two alto clarinets, two bass clarinets, two contras, for example. If I'm writing for an ensemble like that, I'm still going to look at about four. Two oboes, English horn, bass, oboe. Uh, you might could go to six, add in a demore and a third oboe. I don't think you want to go too much bigger than six. Oboes uh, don't work as well in um, larger groups because the intonation will tend to fight amongst one another. Uh, if you spread it out between four different instruments, it'll make it a little smoother. But I, I can't really foresee, unless you're going for a massive piece, I can't foresee going much above six being a maximum. I've noticed much greater distinction between individual oboe virtuosi sounds than, say, virtuosi clarinetists. Virtuosi clarinetists mostly, unless you're going to uh, Germany or Eastern Europe, have a uniform sound model. But in oboists, there's just a lot of variation. You can almost identify an oboe player just from a recording. You don't have any other information. You can figure out who it is by their sound. It's probably the only woodwind instrument where that's the case. Uh, jazz sax players aside, oboe players have that same kind of mentality. They want to have a much more personal sound. It's a very different mindset that oboe players have. It, it, it may be one of the reasons we don't see instruments like uh, bass oboe as often is that oboe players themselves are much more concerned with the, the personality of their main instrument. Final thoughts on bass oboe hecklephone. Both of us agree that the instrument really should be seen much more often. Uh, particularly in a band where it can make a huge impact. It fills in that, that tenor role. And there's nothing that can replace it. There is no instrument that can substitute the sound of a bass oboe or a heckle phone. You can get the range covered, but not the timbre. Exactly. Any updates from you, composition-wise, performance-wise? Well, performance-wise, I've got a gig on Sunday playing a patriotic concert, but... I've, uh, I'm starting to publish arrangements for a bassoon quartet. Once I get to commerce in September, I'm starting a bassoon quartet because there's not much of a bassoon ensemble there. And I've been producing jazz arrangements for this group. You know, uh, adaptions of standards, adaptions of not the worst pop tunes, stuff that can make the instruments more popular if we go to, say, middle schools for instrument petting zoos does that make sense absolutely yeah that that's that'll be marketable I, I would definitely say yes and there's just not a lot of double read ensemble literature out there or at least that i can see am i wrong there is more bassoon ensemble literature than there will be for a, a full double read choir incorporating oboes and bassoons understood Though, if you want to get six English horns together, I can find six oboe players and we can do Hillsong number one. Ah, <laughs> uh, that would be a lovely, lovely piece. Yes, that is a beautiful piece of music, my goodness. So rarely done, too. Yes, but other than that arranging work and a couple of experiments in composition, I'm not doing much other than saving money, paying my bills, and practicing every day. How about you, Britt? Oh, let's see. I've been uh, doing a lot of work on the, the blog this week. I added two new chapters on the course of band orchestration. Uh, it was originally going to be one chapter. It was uh, transcribing uh, music for band from the organ. And so I did uh, several days worth of work on that. It ended up being a 2,500-page article that I split in two. Uh, one article is specifically on the very basics on how organs work and the second article is how to take that knowledge and transcribe organ music to the band so i in the process ended up scoring 40 measures of the uh, famous bach Passacaglia and fugue for 
bands. And I go through detail by detail what I did, how I did it, and say, in the end, this is not the only way. There's so many different ways. Find your own voice. Um, also, hard at work on uh, writing my double concerto for soprano and tenor sax. I'll probably get to work on that after I'm through editing down this podcast. And other than that, that's about it. Um, you can read all about this at uh, bandistration.com. You can subscribe to the podcast there. Uh, it will be on iTunes within a day or so. And you can support me on patreon.com link through the uh, bandistration.com site i've got lots of music up now on cheap music plus uh any final words matt uh support us on patreon listen to the podcast tell us what you think i don't know i'm pretty sure if we get enough comments people can start calling and saying hey talk about the bass trumpets or hey why haven't you guys mentioned the turkish clarinet you know, it might be interesting to get more user involvement as I'd we spread. Abs- yeah. I'd absolutely love that. Say, hey, talk about this and correct us where we're wrong. One correction from last week that I found, uh, we mentioned that the uh, the clarinet, the B-flat clarinet has a bore size of 15.5 millimeters. That was wrong. It's actually 14.6 or 14.8, depending on the maker. So we'll correct ourselves when need be. Yes, please. We don't know everything. Speak for yourself. Darn. (laughs) Well. Okay. Well, I think that's it for today.